and coming to changes in echocardiogram the most important thing that you need to know is that in echocardiogram you will see a focal left ventricular hypertrophy which is very typical of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from prep ladder and coming to changes in echocardiogram the most important thing that you need to know is that in echocardiogram you will see a focal left ventricular hypertrophy which is very typical of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which means you will see an asymmetric LVH. Remember seeing a symmetric or a concentric LVH does not rule out an HCM but very often you will see a focal LVH or called as asymmetric LVH. So if you see this series of images from parasitic short axis you are different uh, areas you can see the first patient did show hypertrophy a focal LVH in the basal septum and this patient is showing a focal LV hypertrophy in the anterior septum and this patient is showing a focal LV hypertrophy in the anteroseptal left ventricle and this patient is showing a focal hypertrophy in the posteroseptal left ventricle and this patient is showing a focal hypertrophy in the anterior free wall and in this parast uh, in this epical four chamber view you can see that the patient is showing hypertrophy of the entire septum interventricular septum so usually more often than not you're going to have a focal left ventricular hypertrophy but seeing a symmetrical or a concentric LVH does not rule out HCM and you can also prove the systolic anterior motion of uh, mitral valve apparatus especially that of the AML by many means but one of the interesting means to uh, measure or probably demonstrate the systolic anterior motion of mitral valve is by M mode echo. How can you demonstrate in M mode echo? So you know in M mode echo during diastole there will be movement of anteromitral effect. Remember the AML is the one that moves more compared to the PML. PML movement will be very subtle or negligible in uh, diastole whereas the AML is going to move very badly during your normal diastole itself. So this is the E wave and this is the A wave. We have discussed it already in the previous sections. But when it comes to systole, your movement of the mitral valve leaflet should not be there technically. We know that. But here you can see the AML still moves a lot. And in fact, it touches the interventricular septum. This is the line of the interventricular septum. It touches the interventricular septum almost. It's a significant systolic anterior motion of anterior mitral leaflet that you typically see in patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can also see uh, even though the PML doesn't move that much in the diastole, there is some significant movement of PML also along with the AML that happens in patients with HCM. But the AML movement during systole is going to be very classic and characteristic. That is what we call it as SAM of AML or systolic anterior motion of anterior mitral leaflet that is seen in M mode echo in this example. And coming to other echocardiographic findings, you can use the continuous wave Doppler at the LVOT to find out uh, what is the LVOT gradient. As I told you, one third of the patients will have gradient at rest itself and the typical shape of the LVOT gradient in continuous wave Doppler is going to be the classic dagger or we can call it as scimitar shaped waveform. It will be very sharp. It's very classic. And how will you measure the gradient? Using the formula 4B square. Classic formula. So in this patient, you can see that the resting gradient velocity is approximately 3 meters per second or 300 centimeters per second. So if you apply that in the formula 4 into 3 squared, which is going to be around 36 millimeters of mercury, it is significant. Anything more than 30 is significant in the LVOT. And you can prove the dynamicity of the LVOT gradient by asking the patient to do a Valsalva maneuver where the gradient increases tremendously. In this example, it is approximately around 4.8 meters per second with Valsalva. So if you calculate the gradient uh, with Valsalva in this individual, it is 4 multiplied by 4.8 meters squared. So which will be approximately 90 to 95 millimeters of mercury which means at rest the gradient is 36 millimeters of mercury with Valsalva the gradient increased to 90 to 95 millimeters of mercury. You are proving the dynamicity of the LVOT gradient and dynamicity of the obstruction.
and as i've told you one third of the patients can show obstruction only during exercise or they may develop a gradient only during exercise which means at rest the gradient may be normal take this patient for example this patient is having uh, a normal lvot waveform which means the velocity of uh, the continuous wave doppler at the lvot at rest in this patient is approximately only 1.5 uh, meters per second and if you calculate the gradient it is 4 multiplied by 1.5 squared so i think it will be approximately around 9 millimeters of mercury so that's all the gradient is nothing more than that but on the other hand if you ask the patient to go for exercise and then if you start measuring the LVOT gradient, it becomes very significant. And during exercise, you can see that the shape becomes more dagger and scimitar shape. And here the patient develops almost like 5 to 6 meter per second of uh, velocity in the continuous wave Doppler waveform. And if you want to measure the gradient, it is 4 multiplied by almost 5 squared, which is more than 100 millimeters of mercury gradient. This patient is developing a significant gradient with exercise. As I told you, one third of the patients may have gradient at rest itself. One third of the patients may have gradient during either exercise or valsalva. Or remaining one third of the patients may not have gradient at all at rest as well as during exercise and valsalva. And of course, it's very important to prove the dynamicity also. So if you prove that the gradient is worsening with exercise or valsalva, then you can probably prove that it is a dynamic LVOT obstruction. And you can also say that the patient is having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by default. And one of the other important things is the fact that a patient with HCM may also have an associated MR. So it's very important that you differentiate between the MR waveform and the LVOT waveform in continuous wave Doppler. Because if you use an epical three chamber view or an epical four chamber view, you're going to have an LVOT here and immediately next to it, you're going to have a mitral valve inflow. So if the patient is having LVOT gradient where the blood is flowing through the iota, it will produce a different waveform. And if you have a MR that is coming from ventricle into the left atrium, that is also going to produce a waveform. Sometimes if you are not opening up the LVOT properly, these two waveforms can merge together and can result in a kind of a hybrid waveform like this. So sometimes it will be very difficult to differentiate, but I can say that this is probably the LVOT waveform and this is probably the MR waveform. So how will you differentiate between LVOT waveform and MR waveform? Usually the LVOT waveform will be more sharp dagger similar shape and MR waveform will be more rounded and more of a dome shaped. And remember any resting gradient more than 100 millimeters of mercury, think about a superimposed MR waveform, which means you are not opening up the LVOT properly. That's why both waveforms are merging with each other. The only way to separate these waveforms is to open up the LVOT better by adjusting your probe. Usually the MR waveform by default will have a gradient of more than 100 millimeters of mercury. By default, the velocities will exceed 5 meters per second, usually. But at resting state, the velocities of LVOT gradient, LVOT waveform will not exceed 5 meters per second generally. It will be less than that. With exercise, it may exceed, but at resting state, it will not exceed. So there are some few differences that you can make out by looking at the waveform plus looking at the amount of gradient that you are measuring as well. And one of the characteristic signs that you can see in the plaques view with regards to HCM patients is going to be your V sign. So what is this V sign? In plaques view, you know this is the left ventricular outflow tract, this is the left ventricle and this is going to be the left atrium and you will be able to see two jets that are going in two directions. The first jet is the LVOT jet that is going from LVOT into the iota and the second jet is the MR jet. As you can see, the MR jet in this example is directed posteriorly suggesting that this MR is basically due to systolic anterior motion of mitral valve. So this is what we refer to as something called as V sign. That is commonly seen in the plaques view. And let us see some of the important echocardiographic videos. As you can see here, this patient is having a significant systolic anterior motion 